Hey everyone, this is the OGM check-in call for Thursday, February 3rd, 2022. Um, I think the middle of the country and the south are having a blizzard and a really bad cold snap. Uh, don't know if that's playing out, playing out the way it was, the way it sounded like it was going to play out, but it sounded pretty nasty. Uh, and then yesterday, Punxsutawney Phil saw his shadow, so we're in for <clears throat> a longer winter, if you believe any of that kind of thing. Um, it's lovely to see everybody. I think it appropriate, Pete, since you launched the biweekly Plex uh, dispatch, to begin with with that and uh, encourage everyone to sign up and uh, so forth. So why don't we go, uh, Pete, Doug, Stacy? Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, thanks, folks, for checking out the biweekly Plex dispatch. I appreciate it. Um, uh, I was up a little late working on it, so I don't know if I have any updates. <laughs> I was like, how did you get that all done? Like, so like, whoosh, whoosh. There's a, I, I did something, I, I did something kind of interesting, which was I kind of made the deadline for submissions midnight the, the day before I wanted to publish it, which allows basically like almost zero, like final, um, final uh, production time. And then of course, uh, at least one person was like a little late on the deadline. And so, but, but then I always hate deadlines that are like, you know, like, I have a little bit of news right at the end and can't you fit it in? So anyway, I, I'm going to stick with it, but be a little bit more, I, I'll get more done before the very end. Awesome. Do you want to talk about it a little bit? Um, uh, it's uh, a biweekly newsletter of uh, what's going on with, uh, with the communities, the inter-communities, uh, OGM and, and uh, around. And um, one of the, I, I did observe, uh, we, I, I was in a couple different meetings with different people and uh, it, one of the effects that I was hoping that the newsletter would have is just that, you know, having a newsletter means that there has to be news, which means I have to go like ask people what's going on, which, which sparked some great conversations. So it was a, a productive kind of, um, we had some productive conversations just because, you know, a community, a, a small group of us had to say something. And then it's like, oh, what would we say? What do we think about that? What are we, you know, what are we doing? What should we be doing? So that was, that felt good. It, it was, it's not a, an obvious, um, it's not an obvious purpose for the newsletter. It seems like the newsletter should be the trailing edge of what's going on, but <laughs> it kind of ends up being the leading edge a little bit too. So I like that. It was a good thing. And some of us had reflexes that are just way too slow. So next time. <laughs> Phil didn't quite get into the deadline. <laughs> but he will next time. Yeah. <laughs> um, awesome. Any other things you want to check in with Pete? There's plenty of stuff going on. No. You good? All right. Let's go, Doug, Stacy Klaus. Okay. Uh, several. It's been a busy week. Uh, and uh, with the confusions around what's actually happening with climate change and the economy and whatever, it's hard to get a good grasp of what's happening. The thing that's most on my mind, as many of you know, I'm working on this book that has the working title of Garden World Politics on the idea that uh, we face a, a difficult future and that the main needs humans are gonna have are gonna be food and habitat. And let's put those together into one project like Italian Hilltowns. Uh, there's a wonderful book by Lou called The Gardens of Democracy. Mm. And the cover shows one farmer in a field of many, many acres working by himself. And the book's title is The Garden of Democracy. That's quite a contrast uh, and a bit weird. Uh, I don't know what to say about, you know, uh, Trying to write about what should happen when things are changing so fast is difficult because the more you see what's happening, the harder it is to get a grasp of what it actually is. Uh, I think as things fall apart, uh, people move further and further away from each other and it's harder to coordinate. And that's kind of where we are. Uh, at the Institute for New Economic Thinking, where I am a consultant of the president, uh, for months, I've been pushing for conversations about climate change. And we finally now have an all staff once a week meeting talking about climate change. And it's been refreshing to have gotten there. 
and an amazing kind of political process. Uh, so, the, and I guess that uh, the, the thing that's on my mind and probably on several of your minds is how bad is it gonna get? And what do we do about that uh, as a kind of overarching question? So I'll stop there. Um, thanks, thanks, Doug. Um... Uh, hold on, do we do about it? I imagine someone else is going to do that, but I wanted to do that. Um, I have not read, and this is a book that I've long wanted to read, but I've not read Pema Chodron's When Things Fall Apart. Oh. I'm wondering if anybody else has, apparently Grace has, and maybe a couple others of you have, and what, if you remember what was in it, how that might apply to the situation Doug just uh, described. Like, what, what sorts of things is Pema recommending we do? No escape. No escape from the situation? Mm -hmm. meaning, uh, meaning what? Um, meaning that we have a kind of addiction to a kind of sense of self and well being where. We try to escape from certain kinds of difficulties, and there's no escaping them. And admitting that, um, and basically making friends with the reality as it is is kind of like the first step to avoiding the kinds of suffering that we encounter when we're always grasping for escape. Um, a really long time ago, I read a self-help book that had a formula called ACT, uh, assess the situation like realistically, like what's actually happening, what's going on, uh, choose what you want to do and take action, something like that. It was pretty, it was pretty good. It, it was, I think, I think accepting reality is important is a useful advice in that sense. Um, By, Byron Katie um, asserts that the source of suffering is um, pretending that what's so is not so. Makes good sense. Pete? I, I think it kind of along the same lines, uh, uh, accepting reality or something like that. I, I remember, I'm old enough to remember that there was a time when we had things that that you know we would say, well, it could never get this bad, um, uh, and then you know we we could never have an executive branch that went psychotic and did um, things that were just like massively damaging to the country, mm -hmm. um, and then and then we did, <laughs> you know, and um, or and or, or another one is. Um, you know, we, we think we, we like to think we prepare for a, a pandemic, like, you know, the, I'm, I'm sure the federal government stockpiles, you know, all the things that we would need and, and we'll just swing into action with um, the, the CDC will know what to do and swing into action and everybody will have an orderly kind of uh, reaction to um, a global health crisis, you know, and, and then we didn't. <laughs> um, so I, I feel like we have kind of this baptism by fire um, uh, of over the past couple of years that at least reset my expectation of what, you know, Doug's question was, how bad can it get? And I used to have these kind of soft answers, you know, like, well, you know, like physically, you, you could imagine things like a zombie apocalypse, but that wouldn't really happen. <laughs> you know, uh, there's a bunch of soft, like, like collaborative things that we would do before it got really bad. Um, and we've kind of blown past those and we keep blowing past them and we've observed the fact that we're blowing past them and we blow past them. And, you know, so it's just kind of interesting thinking about how bad can it get? And I, I guess um, I, I, uh, I'm a little bit OCD with my gadgets. Um, I try to keep my, my phone and, and my, you know, all my, all my gadgets uh, nice and pretty and pristine and things like that. And I remember, um, Kevin Kelly, um, uh, a pundit and writer kind of guy. And uh, he said something like, you know, I kind of like it when my gadgets get a little bit dinged up and, and a little bit scratched and stuff like that. It makes it feel lived in. And that was like mind blowing to me because it's like, no, dude, I can't have that. 
but afterwards, I, I at least can hear that that voice, uh, Kevin's voice in my head, um, even though I, I, I still try to, try to keep my things really nice. But it's kind of the same feeling that I had when we had a, a crazy president and the th same feeling I have when we have a failed uh, health, public health response and things like that. So, so I, we, we don't really talk about how bad it could get. I mean, I, I begin to imagine uh, with the migrations, with the failure of food crops, uh, that we are surrounded by uh, a miserable amount of death. Uh, just, to give you, including just to give you one own. idea. Just to give you one idea, this whole thing about the Ukraine, Ukraine is the fourth largest grain producer in the world, right? You have countries like Yemen, Lebanon, Egypt, Sudan, depend on Yemen for like 10, 20, 30% of their caloric intake. And on Ukraine. Yeah, out of the Ukraine. So if the Ukraine, you know, is, if there's a war breaking out in the Ukraine and it will it, it will involve, of course, these grain coring regions, which is what Russia wants to have back here, um, you will have chaos breaking out in, in parts of the world you don't even think about as being related to this conflict. You know? mm -hmm. And uh, one of our problems is that humans are way too adaptable. Like we will get used to bad situations. We will get used to bad news. Uh, one of Trump's tactics was to always shift the Overton window by shredding it. And then, hey, guess what? Now it's permissible to do this and do that. Uh, the, the, the thing I was, that always makes me like stunned is uh, John Dean was bounced out of the political campaign for yelling too much at his troops. That was like the Dean scream and he was gone. Uh, the, uh, the big scandal in eight years of Obama was that he wore a light gray suit one day. And on any given on any given day of the Trump administration, he did eight things that were like remarkably worse than, than any of those things intentionally and survived. Like like is still like still wandering around doing things. Uh, Grace, you had your hand up a moment ago. Did you want to jump in? I'm going to try trying to grab you between bites. Sorry. Um, I mean, it's a, you know, I I have a feeling the how bad it can get question isn't. A useful question in any way, and and that's what you know that you would look at in like you know the the Buddhist as Jerry alluded to, like what is the important question, and the important question is what do I do and who am I, and what are the actions that I take, and so yeah, it's going to get a lot worse, and you can keep looking at that, but I don't look at the wall. This is like. I don't know if you guys know the Tony Robbins talks about when he was learning how to drive race cars, you know, because it was fun. And his teacher's like, don't look at the wall. Like the most important thing is don't look at the wall. When you're about to crash, the temptation is to look at like the crash, like where I'm going to crash. And as soon as you do, that's where you go. And so I try not to look at the wall, right? I look where am I going and what, what can I do? And, and, um, and it does seem quite quite hopeless indeed, but what's the point of being hopeless about it? Like, I might as well just do something. Um, the other thing I wanted to comment, it's interesting that Doug was talking about this, and I'm also working with another group that's talking about like this blueprint for governance, and you know, like that's my thing, I'm into governance. But I noticed when I was talking to Wendy that, uh, you know, that Wendy and I have a different way of looking at governance completely, and there's, it's not like there's a thing that's the government. It's like there are these flows and input and output mechanisms. And, and I'm, I've been talking about having wheels, like I'd really like to have wheels, but I can't have wheels because I have this particular skeleton. And I've been looking at governance more along that line. Like what are the things that the infrastructure that we have is dictating upon us that no matter what I do, I can't have wheels. And if we can change that, it's kind of invisible, but, but a lot of the, problems we're facing now is really because of the infrastructures that we have that limit our, you know, like pretty much all of human activity at this point to profit. And then, okay, well, if within that, you can, how are you going to have environmental discussion? Anyway, that's it that's yeah. for me. For Thanks. That comment. Thanks, Grace. We've got uh, Stuart, Doug, Gil, Kevin on this topic, and then back to the queue. Yeah, uh, uh, just quickly on the, um, on the analogy of looking at walls, when you learn to drive a motorcycle, they tell you to always look where you want to go, uh, which is just uh, critical. On the on the Trump things that Jerry was saying, 
um, always there have been some unarticulated norms of how democratic governments acted. And Trump, and I'm not a great historian and somebody may know differently, but Trump just came along and he just obliterated all of these norms, the accepted ways of, of doing things. And it's because in part, he comes from the Roy Cohn school of um, how you act in, 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 in the world. Um, there was another thing that I wanted to say, but I can't remember it. So thank you. <laughs> no worries. Uh, Doug. Well, I think we just are not really talking about what could happen. I, I, my own view is that we're better off facing the full reality because it actually then motivates actions that might possibly be adequate. If you don't look at what could happen, uh, you come up with solutions that don't scale into the real problems and it wastes time. Yep. Thanks, Doug. Um, Gil and Kevin. Yeah, I um, want to say something about wheels and walls and norms um, real quickly. Um, Grace, you can't grow wheels, uh, but what you're calling infrastructure as a defined thing isn't the same. You've got biological constraints, but our social constraints are not. They change, things change, and it feels impossible now. But all that stuff is, is malleable at some level. Um, um, the don't look at the walls is really important, but you can't pretend that the walls are not there, to Doug's point. And so I think this is a really delicate balance of how do we you know, not deny um, what may come and think about that and plan for that, but not live in that. Uh, and that's a real challenge. You know, we, we have to live in the affirmative and the creative and what we can do and also do what we can to prepare uh, for, for, for what could happen. And I'm, I'm reminded of Atul Gawande's uh, book, The Checklists. I don't know if folks have seen that. Jerry, it's probably in there somewhere. Um, and he talks about an example of, um, of, of uh, airline catastrophes and the diagnostics of why a particular class of airline crashed. And they, they learned that uh, you're, you're flying this plane, it's got two engines and one of the engines goes out and you're at 30,000 feet, what do you do? And if what you do is jump into action, uh, you and everybody else on the plane dies. And if what you do is have your co-pilot pull out the manual and go through the decision tree to find out what is the situation that we're in. You know, this engine, it's the left engine or the right engine, we're at this altitude or that. Go to page 397 and do the four things that are there. It seems insane to take all that time to do all that stuff when you're hurtling to the ground, but it turns out that's what worked. Uh, so having things thoroughly thought through, thinking about contingencies, building plans, critically important, but these guys don't spend their life flying the plane in the manual. They fly the plane in real time with what's true right now. So that's what, you know, that raises for me. Uh, on the Trump and norms thing, the, the mystery for me there is how are norms maintained? What maintains them? How was he able to break them? Why did, why did the repair mechanisms not arise to prevent that? Uh, and a lot of what, Grace, what you're calling infrastructure is in the realm of norms. Right. And, and Gil, I think, I think you're, the question you just asked seems to me like to be like one of the re really important sort of levers in the situation because mm -hmm. Trump realized that he could continually expansively break norms and, and then keep it. And then we got used to him breaking norms and it would be like, ah, it's just another day with Trump doing Jerry, wild Jerry, say, things. Jerry, say Trump and Bannon. Yeah. And, and he Trump didn't and, do this. He didn't figure this out himself. And Trump, Bannon, Cohn. I mean, I think, I think Trump has a, uh, he, Trump was well-trained by a whole bunch of people and then picked up a bunch of things that he was able and skilled to do. But um but part of the problem is that when there is no repercussion for breaking the norm, then the norm yeah. fails, right? And, yeah. and, and so everybody else was unable to say, hey, something should happen for this norm breaking. And one of the reasons OGM exists is I was hoping that the press corps would have a persistent memory of some sort. And let's pretend that the press corps would agree and say, hey, here's six things, even, even those of you on the, on the other side, uh, of the fence. Here's six things we all agree are actually not facts. They're complete lies. They're fabrications. And, and let's see if we can find those six. 
the next time we're in a press conference that standing in front of him, when he hits the first one, we're going to you know, hit a buzzer. At the second one, we're going to turn off our cameras and leave the room. Mm -hmm. because, because for Trump, media is oxygen. He didn't care at all whether it was good or bad news or bad coverage. If somebody was yelling at him, but he looked powerful, mm -hmm. he was happy. And sorry to go off on this long Trump digression, but it seems yeah. to me really important because the norm breaking helps us forget the reality of our situation and helps us forget the scale of the dangers in front of us. Yeah. Uh, sometimes then we start exaggerating the scale of the dangers in front of us. That's happening too. Uh, you know, all of this, uh, all of this seems to be going on simultaneously, but there, there was something yeah. there. Well, among the norms that have been broken are the norms of journalism, such as they were, they were not perfect at all. Jeffrey Zucker, who just has resigned in disgrace from CNN, um, aside from his sexual depredations, um, uh, has apologized for all the air that he gave to Trump in 2016. And somebody did the analysis and, you know, I mean, the newspaper, you know, the, the news media likes things that are on fire, that are dramatic. And so it's, you know, there's an attraction to him, but somebody figured out they gave him about $2 billion worth of free media in the 2016 primary season. Bernie Sanders couldn't get airtime, was largely blacked out till fairly late in the campaign. And Trump got $2 billion worth of free media. What if it had been, what if Bernie had gotten a billion or what if this thing was spread evenly or what if they acted like actual journalists? Uh, in the game. So, yeah, so, so there are norms that were just shattered early on, but norms shattered by some of the norms, because part of the norms of the media was, if it bleeds, it bleeds. This is dramatic. This is fun. You know, put it on the air. Uh, sure. Sell on calls, make money. So what you just said, I've been tracking for a while in my brain, which I'm sharing here, uh, and is the reason Zucker should have resigned way back when, in disgrace, forget an affair with a colleague. Yeah. This yeah. is important. And then I actually recorded a video um, and said this on a panel uh, in, in Colorado and stuff, but it, I'll, I'll pass this video over here. But um, when, when Trump basically, um, uh, what was the thing that he did? Oh, when Trump rolled over Romney, does everybody remember when Mitt Romney tried to stop the Trump train? Uh, Romney did a press, uh, Romney did a, a press briefing. Somebody forgot to turn off the PowerPoint. So he had slides on his face, which was terrible. And he said, and he said, this man is out of control. He's dangerous. He's awful. We should, we should, you know, he's, he, he was trying to, to uh, snap the whip back. And Trump then has uh, his own little press conference, but waits and treats the whole thing as airtime. At that moment, Zucker should have said, hey, everybody, uh, this man has figured out how to use us against you. And until mm -hmm. we sort out how to respond, we're going to show you a lot less of him. Yeah. And that's in this video here, which I'll, I'll share yeah. right now. Note that note that um, Romney, after that, um, has you know hardly ever voted against Trump, right, or anything. Um, somehow, aside from the norms, there is some grip that this guy has on the whole political class where they dare not cross him. Um, somebody played yesterday Kevin McCarthy's speech after the January sixth insurrection, and he was intense and fierce and highly critical. Uh, and then, within a matter of days, he shut up and towed the line. Uh, and we still don't know quite what that is. For, for Lindsey Graham, there was like, there was a 24 hour period in which he played a golf game with Trump and completely reversed. And one of our sports here at home is to try to imagine what that conversation was. You know, did he have videotapes of Lindsey Graham? Does he, uh, you know, have a, I mean, does he have a hit squad? Does he have, you know, piles of money to bribe? Diving into modern power a lot more. I mean, it's, you know, right. it, could, it, it could be just, I will not let you win your next election, but it seems like there's something more than that in there. Mm -hmm. If a guy could reverse in 180 in 24 hours. Um, we had yeah. Kevin and then Mark in the queue, and then I'll go back to my original queue. And what Doug, the cat's me? tail in your face is really funny. <laughs> what happened to me? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Stacey. I didn't, uh, that, well, then when I say, then we go back to the queue, you're the tip of the queue. So these comments are all still um, kind of in the tail of what we're talking about, which we've done now for a long time. So we'll be right over to you, Stacey. Uh, Kevin, then Mark. Okay. On Lindsey Graham, you know, there's a lot of male uh, uh, escorts in D.C. who have I've threatened to, to come out. Um, but the, uh, the thing I've been doing uh, for the last week is looking further at places where things are really working. So the Devon Donut, Zero Carbon, Guildford, and finding you know what the genesis of that is and the role yep. of different anchor institutions. One is the uh, 
University of Exeter in Sussex and one is the Biosphere Reserve and, and how they got to that point. And, uh, and just, you know, what, what's the dynamics in, um, of, of where things are really working? Uh, and uh, it's pretty interesting, the patterns I'm finding, and I'm, I'm going deeper into, um, you know, uh, interviews with them and, and some about the, the folks under the hood and, and what messaging is working with the donut economy that wasn't working with the biosphere reserve, it wasn't working with transition towns. And uh, so anyway, um, uh, you know, a lot of things don't work some places. Some, some places people are really figuring out how to have a, a coherent collective local response that is, is making a big difference. So that's where I'm looking. Thanks, Kevin. Um, was that your check-in or was that your comment on the previous thread? Well, that's my, yeah. I mean, the, the other thing is uh, I'm being asked with this work I do with economic justice to talk to bigger folks for whom, you know, inclusion is like episode five, you know, it's, it's uh, climate is number one and two and three. And uh, so I'm, I'm figuring out how to get on their agenda. Um, and, and, and summarize, I mean, you know, it's, it's about shifting a power from below, which I can, you know, people are shifting redlining, people are uh, holding the line against hedge funds, uh, trying to reverse, uh, displace black Wall Street, and then um, sole proprietors becoming business owners, realizing they have the power to negotiate with their vendors, which they never realized before. And so it's, it's a lot of interesting rule changing and you know, you don't. People on the top never change the rules, and there's no reason for them to. But people on the bottom, we're finding some replicable ways that they can change the rules and shift things. So that's pretty cool. So that's my check-in. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Uh, Mark, if you have a comment back on the previous, it's thread. a comment on the previous thread. Go crazy. So, I've been paying a lot to Neville Chamberlain mm. and how appeasement got a bad name. And certainly, appeasement is a very universal human behavior. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And it doesn't work with Trump. And Trump has found a way to break norms in ways that people like. And I don't exactly know, you know, what to do. You know, how to basically say, um, I'm not sure how to articulate the sense in governance where if somebody stops a disaster from happening, they don't really get a credit, the credit of letting the disaster happen and then, you know, marching in and dealing with the disaster. There's a pattern that I don't know how to name and I wish I could. And if anybody can help with that, I'd really appreciate it. And that's the comment. Um, can, you just, can you describe the pattern just a wee bit more? And that'll give us a little bit more sort of um, fertile, a little more fuel for thinking about how to describe it as a pattern. Yeah, I'm trying to remember where I had heard it. And it, it had come up several different times. But basically, if we have a taxation regime proposal that is going to basically make the middle class beholden to the people with a heck of a lot of money with billionaires and basically eliminate the lower class the people who work to prevent that from happening are not going to be credited with a reward in terms of, gosh, they, they really did a good job. Thank you so much. We're going to keep you in office. It doesn't have a kind of um, prevention, it doesn't have a kind of aesthetic pull as reaction. Um, does that help in any way? I think so. And, and, and anybody else who wants to elaborate on this or, or play it out, feel free to jump in whenever on the call. I would, um, just, note, I would just note that uh, we need to pay attention to who owns the media that report on these stories and decide which stories are worthy of reporting or not. That's all. Sounds good. 
Um, let us work our way back to the queue now. And we had Stacy, Klaus, Wendy, Gil. Yeah, sorry about I'm that, sorry. Stacey. No, that's okay. And I'm sorry I didn't get to go earlier because I hate to change to shift the conversation because I love this one and I can't even get involved because I'm thinking about what I need to say. Um, we've had some conversations about um, why we're not chatting in the matter most. And one of the things I brought up is that there wasn't enough motivation for like somebody like me to do that. But in reading Pete's Plex, and learning that Vincent has a cat bot that we'd be able to use that would be able to pull out everything we have in this chat and help us create an external memory. I think that's motivation. And I wanted to kind of bring that, just mention that here because there's a lot of stuff in this chat already and that would have been useful. So that's really all I have to say. And <laughs> That's it. Um, Stacy, thanks. And, and we recently had this conversation about, hey, should we keep trying to shepherd us uh, over to the Mattermost chat so that we have persistent chat between all the sessions, which I find super useful. And then also it lets us, it lets us go, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That thing, that question Mark asked earlier, I think I have an answer now two days later, right? That, that, that leads to that really nicely. Um, so uh, Pete or someone, if you would put a link to the calls uh, channel in the Mattermost um, I, I, now we're already half uh, deep into this call, but um, but Stacey, I, I like the idea, and and we didn't determine that I would make a, that effort at the start of the calls, but should I? So uh, well, now uh, that I saw, like I said, for me personally, yeah, I'm willing to go the extra mile because there's a you know, I feel like I'm doing a service, whereas before, I don't really need to do it. So I'm wondering if there are other people that might feel the same. Um, straw, brief straw poll, raise your hand if you think going over to the Mattermost would be useful and is something we should put some energy into. No, knowing that knowing that Vincent has, a, uh, what is it called? A catabot that he could actually use to help us harness this stuff. It's not just throwing it there because we think it might be better. I think that's a tough question to answer, Jerry. Um, I was going to do this, but <clears throat> I don't know if that would be confusing. No, it, be it's good. like um, uh, it needs more context around it, right? Like, you know, are we only going to use MetaMask? Are we only going to use Zoom? Uh, are we going to use both? What happens for people who can't make it into MetaMask? There's a bunch of questions, you know. Yeah. yeah. If I if I had my druthers, there'd be a little plugin that would replace this chat with our MetaMask chat, and there would be no Zoom chat file because the interface would blend elegantly and nobody would, we wouldn't have to worry about the other questions you just raised, Pete, but that does not exist. That is not the, the, the current present. Yeah, for, I was, for, me, for me, it's just too much to do Zoom and Zoom chat and Mattermost chat all together. I was like, so I, 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 I periodically go there and try, but I wind up not doing it habitually. So it's too many oars in the water at the same time. I need one ring. Yeah. And I was about to say some of the most successful Zoom sessions I've had um, did not use the chat and were using external mm. Um, mm. Uh, memory systems and chat systems and you know you're able to you know post um, images videos I mean basically see something richer than what zoom chat affords mm -hmm. um, so thanks for bringing that up Stacey mm. let's go back to the check-in round so Klaus Wendy Gill yeah, so I would like us, I would like to bring us back to what Doug started uh, talking about because we're really in a whole lot more trouble than most people realize. And and you know I've been working on food and in, in, in agriculture for you know ten years now since my retirement, and getting increasingly alarmed about seeing the system deteriorate without um, <laughs> without anyone really jumping to it. And I was in a in a meeting yesterday uh, where Vilsack, Secretary of Agriculture Vilsack was speaking um, and uh, it was a congressional hearing and he got challenged on wanting to engage the American agriculture into climate change mitigation because, uh, you know, this uh, 
Congress person is my 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 voters don't talk about climate change. So why are we talking about climate change with agriculture? And I, I mean these guys are just so stupid. It is it is incomprehensible to listen to. But the European Union is way out there already, mm -hmm. and 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 determined you know, to to uh, initiate this change. Um, and I'm I'm on the advisory council for the four per thousand initiative, which drives the agricultural policy mm -hmm. in Europe. Um, and and so we have been comparing notes, you know, for for you know, I think three years now. Uh, and they are they are they are moving now at at speed. It, it's mm -hmm. it's really amazing to see. Mm -hmm. But the 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 core issue is funding. You need funding. And in order to mobilize the transition in agriculture, which needs to be done because we can't afford, you know, two, three, four more growing seasons uh, to pass. When you when you look at crop losses in the United States last year, it's incredible. I just posted an, an article where uh, in the last five years, crop losses have uh, quadrupled in the United States. I mean, think of the Mississippi River Delta, think of California. California is flat out of water and California produces 50% of the US produce and fruits, right? I mean, there are some key crops where they're in the 80, 90% range, like broccoli and stuff like that. And so then you go in, so how can you develop a funding mechanism, you know, that, that supports this transition from uh, conventional farming, chemically intensive conventional farming towards, uh, uh, regenerative organic farming. And the problem is that the farmer needs money up front, right? So these, in the, the way the carbon markets are structured is that once you do you know, these, these things, then uh, we calculate how many tons of carbon that may have sequestered and then we'll pay you for it. Well, that's, that's too late, first of all. Besides, it is not a process structure that leads to regenerating the soil into organic status. So I'm putting out uh, as a paper that I've been, where I've been summarizing my thoughts about how uh, something like this could happen. But basically um, you, the, the farmer needs to develop a model uh, that, that shows how I can transition from where I am today to what am I going to do first, which is probably stop tilling your, your soil and put a cover crop on it to what am I doing next, meaning I have to use a crop that, that pulls nitrogen into my soil. You know, so, so, so really focused on um, shifting my growing the, the, the cycle into what is good for the soil, prioritizing basically the design imperative for these changes is the restoration of soil. Well, then instantly that boils down to, so now you have different types of crops coming out. Who's going to buy those, right? Because the entire food system is so locked down into this monopolized, centralized process of growing corn and soy. I mean, there's like, there's like four crops that produce 60% of the world's calories. And so to change all that means you have to have a, a, a whole systems change. Right? So the entire supply chain has to adapt and you, you have to turn the entire system down, uh, upside down because when you think about how the Impossible Burger and, and you know, all these plant uh, uh, protein extracts uh, are working, no one paid any attention to what that does to agriculture. Right? I mean, they've, they've, they went out there, uh, uh, you know, if we take this crop and we will we'll genetically modify this corn or this soy, then you know, that optimizes the amount of protein we can draw out of it. No one paid any attention to what is this going to do in the agricultural sector, you know, to the soil behind it. So, so the, the, I mean, from a design perspective, this is a colossal failure of thinking, a colossal failure of the imagination, you know. And, and now you have billions and billions of dollars invested in this market shooting us into the wrong direction because it's a continuation of monocropping practices that require chemicals which destroy the soil. So then you go into the crypto markets, right? Because here, hey, here's the creative guys, here are the hedge fund managers, here's uh, 
the guys who are coming up with this amazing DAOs and let's take all the acronyms and all the intellectual powerhouses, right? Are figuring out how to bring creative funding to the fore. And when you talk with these guys, everybody is out to get rich. I mean, the only thing they can think of is what's in it for me, right? So, did, so even in the financial markets, these guys are just completely out of it. I, I mean, there, there is, you, you simply cannot sit down and say, okay, what are we trying to, to, to do here as an outcome, right? How, how can we, how can we uh, create a funding mechanism where even inside the community, people can put some money in because I want my local farmers you know, to do this and to regenerate and so on. So finance is the key to this. Now, when you look at what the European Union uh, is doing here, that just came out, it just came out today. Um, basically, the, the, we, we have been comparing notes you know, from a strategic perspective and, and they're just wrong. They're, the Europeans are, yeah, we got to do this. You know? And so they are out there. Here in the US, we talk about it and there is basically you know, intellectually an understanding across, across uh, you know, all the NGOs somewhere engaged in it, but you can't get the energy mustered to consolidate a plan and, and, and to structure you know, a a, uh, a, a, a coherent strategy, which then anybody can, can, can jump onto. And that in my mind is the principle of a DAO, right? A distributed autonomous organizational network needs to have a common strategy. Otherwise it's just shooting all over the place and it's just nonsense, right? So I'm like super frustrated because, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I talk literally, I talk with one group who uh, wants, to engage in the funding financing of uh, uh, transitioning to regenerative agriculture. And they literally told us that they are looking at 500,000 acres minimum. So they're consolidating farmland, right? Bringing it together in some really uh, complex financial scheme, um, which then you know, is a great, these, the, the, the plan then is you know, to make this feedstock for uh, the the impossible meat kind of products. Uh, so big monoculture fields, growing soy, growing corn, what other peas are now big in there. It's insane. These people are all insane, right? And this is what Doug uh, is saying is that to, 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 to Doug and I, these people appear to be insane because they refuse to accept the reality of, of the situation we're facing. We're well, in deep shit, guys. I mean, the 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 climate system is changing on so many levels so fast, right? And the only way you can catch that is by photosynthesis, meaning restoring nature, you know, to allow nature to, to function again and, and to stimulate photosynthesis, to pull you know, carbon out of the atmosphere, to protect the soil, to restore the water cycles, because that's also a part of restoring soil is you're restoring water cycles. And, and to, to just ignore all that, you know, and, and, and keep running after the stock market and after the next financial gig, incomprehensible to me. I'm sorry. I mean, I just, I'm just like, I need to calm down <laughs> and, and figure out. So I'm, and, and so the difficulty is to pull together a team that has the intellectual capacity, the cognitive capacity, you know, to, and the, and the skills, right, to pull together a, a financial uh, a model, you know, that, that can be replicated uh, easily, that can be spread out uh, across uh, multiple uh, actors and, and, and work at scale, because I can tell you the government isn't going to do it. Even so, Wilson uh, wants to do it, he talks about doing it, he's not going to be allowed to do it. So anyway. Um, thanks, Klaus. Um, I want to throw a couple things in the conversation and then I'll pass to Doug and Grace. <clears throat> um, but let me share screen for a second because I've been... Uh, so Mark Trexler has Climate Web where he collects up enormous amounts of climate specific information. His Climate Web is organized a bit differently from what I do in climate. So I'm just offering mine. I put a link to this thought in the chat earlier. But what will cause people to change their minds about climate, which is under mitigating climate change, which has a whole bunch of stuff anyway. Uh, but then I've got 
uh, urgent reports exhorting swift climate change and IPCC and you know here's the IPCC reports 2018, 2019, <clears throat> et cetera, et cetera. And then another thought, despite urgent reports, nobody is really acting on climate, cha climate change. The dangerous moment is 2019 begins, which I put in back in 2019. Coronavirus and authoritarianism distract us from dealing with climate change, all these kinds of things. Then separately, <clears throat> um, uh, I subscribe to Noah Smith's, <clears throat> excuse me, No Opinion uh, Substack Pub. And he, his, his offer this week was how to sell Georgism to the middle class. And Georgism said there's a land value tax. We should just screw all the other taxes. We should tax land. And I'm not going to suggest this, and I am clearly no, uh, no uh, tax expert. But what I'm going to, and, and here's a, a link to that particular episode of his uh, Substack Pub. But I'm going to say, what if we had a soil organic matter tax? What if, we, what if we shifted things around for all farmers and said, hey, guess what? Your soil organic matter is above this number. You pay no taxes. In fact, you get some rebates, you get some credits, whatever, whatever. Your soil is depleted. You pay ferocious amounts of money um, to actually bring it back into health. And we're gonna, we're gonna just financially refocus all your attention on making the soil healthy. And whatever you do to make the soil healthy will be rewarded and subsidized. And whatever you do to damage the soil will be like penalized uh, as hard as we can get it. And I know that any large scale tax regime change is almost impossible in this country, but that seems to me like, like fine. I'm like, God, finance can't be the whole answer, but sometimes uh, incentive structures really do work and people will vote with their wallets and uh, move around that way. So uh, I wanted to just uh, say, does that ring at all for anybody but, or ignore but that? The, but the thing is that there is value in restoring soil on multiple levels, right? So, so you have uh, USDA, for example, has funding for pollinator protection, you know, for a, a biodiversity, for water retention, and they, uh, they are individual funds, but they all, they, are, they all come down to basically the farmer needs to change his practices because all of these things are being addressed when you restore the soil microbiome, you know, you automatically restore uh, uh, nutrient density and the water retention capacity of the exactly soil. right yeah. so 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 by aggregating these things into one process step right which is what i'm suggesting basically in in this uh, outline that i have put here by aggregating these benefits you can bring money to the farmer and you pay it up front because the farmer needs money up front before he can do anything because these guys are working and on a shoestring. On or, or negative, they're basically, or negative. They're yeah. basically so, taking loans to try to buy the seed for the next year, they're, they're, they're underwater. So the idea is that literally the farmer, and figuratively sometimes. Yeah, the farmer commits himself, herself, you know, to I'm going to do these process <laughs> steps and it'll take me somewhere between three and five years to get into organic certification. So I'm, I need X amount of money up front, and then, then in the second year, I need more money, but I have to pass an audit as a first step that, that, that certifies that I, I am living up to what I have committed myself to do. And then you get the next tranche, and then the final release is coming when you get your certified status. It's a, just a practical basis. You can't make it true. Land, landowners uh, benefit from it because your land value increases, right? You can use it for carbon offset. You can use it for for vent for uh, processes like Kellogg, you know, like uh, General Mills and all these companies to get organic content because they need organic inputs because that's where the market is going. So they, it, it, it is just a logical way, you know, without penalties, but only really incentives. Know, to mm -hmm. shift this market at, on, at scale. Yeah. Thanks, Klaus. Uh, Doug, Grace, and then we'll go back to our queue. Yeah, Klaus, I think that part of the difficulty with what you're proposing is that most of us sense that it would support agribusiness and concentration of ownership. Uh, so that there are two models. One is we do everything together in an organized hierarchical way, or the other is radical decentralization. And some of us are hoping that agriculture can push us to a non-financial solution to the way the community works. So we're, what you're doing, uh, which is terrific, I don't want to undermine that in any way, but it takes us to the dilemma of what it's doing to the ownership of the economy and who runs it, who, who benefits from it. 
But that is the beauty of the potential these DAOs have, because they have the potential to, to decentralize the funding sources to the point where a small farmer can participate. Uh, it, it, and it's the opposite of what, what is now happening where uh, uh, the, uh, the, the multinational companies basically are, are developing a system that funds ever larger farmers. You know, they need thousands of the incentive systems in the current carbon market are structured to consolidate farms. You need like 10,000, 20,000 acres before that even makes sense. Doing it, do it using these, these, these funding mechanisms that are emerging because of blockchain based, based uh, technologies gives us the opportunity for this decentralization that you're looking for. Our Grace and Gil. I think you guys spoke about most of what I'm talking about, but you know, most of what I wanted to say, like I think Doug said most of it. I do think we need these solutions that are in some ways financeable, but we also need to be moving towards non-financial economies. So yeah. That's all. Yeah. That that's my frustration with finance is the answer, kind of in a sense as well. Uh Gil briefly and then back to the queue. Yeah, but finance is part of the way the current world works. Uh, I think the, the the debate between decentralization and centralization is not the most useful one to have because uh, we need decentralization and local control and responsiveness. We also need coordination at larger and even planetary levels. And so the question is, how do we dance both of those? Um, uh, I don't know the DAOs are the way to do it, but it's a clue perhaps about how do you have um, you know, particularly decentralization of ownership, not concentration of wealth, but higher levels of coordination and do those together. Uh, in the current game, we're all aimed at getting big corporations and big governments to do the right thing and impose the solutions on all the rest of us. And that's, you know, got intrinsic flaws. Um, just grassroots by itself doesn't get us the coordination. And so, you know, and then the, the heart of that question is why OGM is so interesting to me, because we're sort of playing right in the middle of that question. Thank you, Gil. Um, let's go Wendy, Gil, Stewart, Mark, me. That's assuming, Scott, that you are listening in and don't want to chime in. Otherwise, I'll put you in the queue. Well, this is so fascinating. Thank you, everybody, for this great discussion. Um, so where I've been, so this is sort of a re reaction and comments on what we've been talking about and also a check-in for what I've been working on and how um, what I've been thinking about. And so hearing from, from some threads from this conversation and what's the, the richness that's happening in chat also about the need for you know, coordination of, maybe, maybe a different way to say it is self-coordination of communities and um, like this one. Um, so I've been working, some of you know, I've been working on a project that I've called the tapestry. And it, I, I'm realizing in this conversation, what I'm really trying to enable is not just a, a, a way for people to see their thread or their piece in a sided community, although that's definitely where it starts, but it's also a place for the community to see itself as a system, right? So, so I'm trying to be very careful about um, the, the ontology that I'm using so that the ontology is holistic and yet broad enough that people can define it for themselves. They don't need, it's not so rigid that people are wondering where they fit in or worried about the, the terms that are used um, so that they can then um, identify themselves first, just be seen. So what's been exciting for me over the last couple of weeks as I've, um, and thank you to the people who come to the flotilla calls. Um, and Pete for holding that space because we've spent some time on this project in, in the last couple of weeks and it's been really helpful. And then I've had um, individual conversations with quite a few of you who've, who've taken the time to um, fill out your pieces, um, put your threads in the tapestry. Um, and the feedback has been really encouraging just from that first step of people seeing, seeing the holistic structure made them ask themselves for the first time, oh, I didn't think of myself in this spot, but actually I'm in this spot or I'm in that spot. So just the self-awareness first of, 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 of seeing their piece, I think people found um, more fun than, than I was expecting. But to me, the real, um, the real excitement comes when, when a community can see itself. And so right now I'm, I'm working with Vincent. Um, I was trying to work and kind of 
I, some of you saw the Excel spreadsheet and that's fine for the, for the moment, but working with Vincent to um, put something on Trove or to have something, um, an, a separate app, even on Bubble.io that other communities could use. Then we're gonna start off with um, just a private space for individual communities to see themselves. So OGM will definitely be one of those communities where we'll invite in once we have something ready to go, thinking probably real, I'd love it to be tomorrow. <laughs> Realistically, it's probably more like a, a couple of weeks. And, um, and then what happens is you can then, you know, the joy of this for us as we're talking about it is that it's not just one more map that's one person put together and everyone else can see, which is great, but that's not what we're going for. What we're going for is you can see it and you can change it. So you get to filter it however you want because it's gonna be a lot of information. And you also get to change your pieces whenever you want or add pieces whenever you want. You also get to suggest resources and other things so that other people can see. So if you put resources, say, in economics, the crosshairs of economics and agriculture, for instance, um, by putting it, there's a row for the economy right now, and then you could tag it with agriculture keywords, right? So let's say you did that, then you would see all the people that are trying to work on that and what stages of their project they're in. It just allows for people to finally, you know, um, see all the people, projects, resources, funding, like all in one place, then let's say, let's wave a magic wand, pretend that's happened and people are happy with the interface and they feel like they can use it. Now we can finally ask questions. Where's the funding going and why in this community? Uh, where, is there's a where is there a bunch of expertise or interest and how can we capitalize on that? Maybe we need as a community, ooh, there's, we didn't even know. There's so many people over in this these areas. Let's have a special uh, breakout conversation about it. So it's really just the beginning. Um, it's not a solution. It's the stuff that we need that leads us to better solutions. It's the stuff that we need that leads us to better cooperation. It's the stuff that we need that enables better collaboration. So that's what I've been working on. And um, I had a note. No, that got covered. Okay. That's me. Thanks, Wendy. Uh, and it's really interesting because um, in through the course of many of our conversations, I've borrowed the metaphor of mosaics and mm -hmm. tiles as little small elements of mosaics. Mm -hmm. And the framing or intention of that was that each project, whether it's CSC or everyone's wisdom or uh, uh, everybody else or, or Trove or whatever, um, paint some vision of where they were headed that looked like a mosaic. And then the, the tile elements of the mosaic were things that needed to get done to make that mosaic happen, to put, to put it in place. And part of my goal was, wouldn't it be great if there was some kind of a dashboard where we could look up and see tiles that said, this tile needs somebody who's really good at bookkeeping or web design or graphic illustration yeah. or, or constructing DAOs. And then, um, a, a tile that served multiple projects because what, the, the goal here would be try to find multiple use and modularity as much as possible and open source as much as possible. But any tile that served multiple projects would be like a triple word score in Scrabble and should be funded before others should like get priority because wow, if we put this pile in, this tile in place, it goes. Now, the mosaics that I was talking about were not current status, they were wishful thinking vision and hopefully compelling vision for each project. And it seems to me like, like the tile and the tapestry are, are sort of the same kind of object, except in different sections from different perspectives at different points in time. And I think, I think those, those metaphors are both, I, I love obviously tapestry for the weaving metaphor because weaving the world, et cetera, et cetera. Story threading, I'm like completely on board with textile metaphors. Uh, never mind that we call it the fabric of society. There's a reason we call it the fabric of society, right? The, the warp and the weft are, are, are interdependencies and our connections and our, the trust between us. So anyway, I, I, I think that's very rich territory and I'm looking forward to what you're, what you're building. Yeah, and I know Gil, you're, you're eager to say something. Let me just respond really quick. One of the things that emerged this week that was really, well, two things, let me back up first. Yes, I think it's really important to, to be able to identify the projects that are in the emergent space versus in the application space. And oftentimes, especially for, for groups like this one, we're, we're actually trying to think about both at the same time, which I, I, I you know, obviously think that's a, that's a good view and a more holistic view, but um, I've separated them out because sometimes it really they really do sit in different places. And oftentimes people have 
uh, different skills around that too, in terms of expansive thinking versus um, integrative thinking is tends to be two different skills as well. And so sometimes often projects kind of align themselves that way. So it does separate that out, which I think is really exciting too. Um, and then one of the concepts that emerged this week as we were thinking about mosaics and other things, um, Jerry, is I think what we may be talking about actually is the mortar between the pieces. And that goes back to what Grace and I were talking about too. It's, it's the stuff that's not getting funding because it's not, not only is it not the thing, it's not even the pieces. It's the stuff that's enabling the pieces to stick together. Um, love that. And um, I refer sometimes to glial cells. Mm -hmm. uh, so everybody thinks neurons do all the work and our brains are all about neurons. Well, like there's a whole bunch of cells called glial cells that sort of in part, they hold the neurons in place and they're kind of the glue between the neurons, but in part, they're also apparently some kinds of neurotransmitters. And then the brain function, brain function is, I think, really more complicated than most people think. There's a nitrous oxide that flows through our brains as a neurotransmitter, as a gas wafting, wafting through uh, what we are. There's a whole bunch of things, never mind trans, you know, going into the interpersonal space and, and sort of uh, resonances between people that, that are part of, you know, the collective hive mind or, or whatever else. But, um, uh, and mycelia, we've, we've worked on a lot as a, as a metaphor as well. Uh, we love that. So, so, so uh, I'll post a, a link to a, a thought that I created recently called uh, nature metaphors that are really useful. Um, because all these things are, are give us tools to explain what, what the hell we're talking about. And when Klaus comes in and says, hey, we have to sort of observe nature and pay attention to nature and, and reward people for behaving like nature does and replenishing nature, yes. And, 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 and we've replaced those metaphors with these mechanistic, invisible, handy things that um, have eaten our minds and Grace and others are trying to create projects to replace those scripts with new scripts that'll help us come back to the healthy civilization, which may not involve a lot of money, mm. right? I mean, we may, when we talk about a post money or, or post capitalist economy or whatever, those are the kinds of things that come up. And, and I'm, I'm, I love that soil. I, I want us to turn that soil a lot. And I think it was Gil who asked earlier, Klaus, while you were talking whether regen dot something is doing what you're talking about, like, yeah, I would love us to find the projects that most exemplify this kind of work, this kind of thinking, and put them up in the spotlight, up in some kind of spotlight for us that say, hey, if you if you had a little extra time to spend, go learn about these or go help them if you can, because they're doing, as much as we can tell right now, the right thing in all of these uh, directions. So thank you for that. Um, we have Gil Stewart, Mark Scott, me. Yeah, it's, uh, it's been very busy up here. I'm going to try to speak focused and coherently. Wendy, yes, I have been waiting to say things, but I'm really glad that I speak after you because um, you've, you've, you've fed a lot of this. So thank you for that. Um, let me try to do this in three acts. Um, check in for me. I'm, I'm, I'm in an entrepreneurial fervor and uh, also deeply, deeply concerned about climate and democracy. Um, and with a sense of despair that I haven't felt since golly, you know, early 60s nuclear confrontation stuff. Um, um, I think I talked about it before when I watched uh, Don't Look Up um, back in December, I was in a profound funk for like two or three days, which is really uncharacteristic for me. Um, and it's important because when we think about change, I mean, the latest polls show that something on the order of 70 some odd percent of Americans are either deeply concerned or concerned about climate change, which you wouldn't see from the politics at all. Uh, 50 some odd percents have no fucking idea what to do. And so the, 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 the projects like the tapestry that say, here are things that are going on uh, across the vast range of concerns that you may have. Here's places where you can touch um, David Gershon uh, had, has this wonderful phrase. He says, everybody feels like whatever they do might be like a drop in the bucket. But if you can see the bucket and you can see that your drop and somebody else's drop and somebody else's drop start to raise the water level over time, it's a very different mood than like, oh, I'm just one person with just a drop in the bucket. So the tapestry is brilliant for that. Paul Hawken did a version of this years ago with Blessed Unrest, 
where he tried to list all the groups in the world working on issues of climate justice and, 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 and environment and sustainable ag and so forth. And when he would talk, he would roll it as a, as a, as a, as a scroll on the slide screen behind him. And it would roll for 20 minutes of just list, you know, group after group. And he'd say, you know, we could run this for about another eight hours. To give you just a sense of the scale of enormous creative activity, grassroots and other levels around the world that is not the fodder for the mainstream media. So this stuff is deeply important. And for me, the, um, the, um, the phrase that I always remember is from Ken, Ken Boulding, who years ago said that existence is proof of the possible. You know, if you tell me something's impossible, but I can show you where it's actually happening, you can no longer say it's impossible. You might say it won't work for me or I don't like it or whatever, but you can't any longer say it's impossible if it's there on the ground. So um, yay, Wendy, and I think Jerry, your, your riff on that of how we use the modern OGME capability to turn that not in just a scrolling slideshow that Paul did, but an actionable web of interconnection of people is brilliant and really thrilling. Um, um, act one, act two. Um, um, what was the thing? Um, somebody talked earlier on about, about our addiction to self. Um, and it's not just our addiction to self, it's our addiction to me and you as separate things, right? Me and nature as separate things. And so I've been taking refuge these last two weeks uh, in the passing of Thich Nhat Hanh, the great Buddhist teacher. Um, Jane was playing the funeral ceremonies, which went on for, I think, like a week as, as, as our background media for much of that time. And I've been listening the last few days to lectures from um, um, uh, a guy named Pham Dung, who I'm told is the Dharma heir for Thich Nhat Hanh, um, in some brilliant, brilliant, deeply moving lectures about, um, among other things, the nature of the self. Uh, one titled No Birth, No Death, which will make a Western mind crazy until you step into it. And it's just rich and profound and challenges the default that we all live in of separation. Like, so, you know, you, we think that immediately, we categorize immediately. We find distinctions immediately, but the, one of the images they use is the waves on the ocean and you know, the, you know, the waves crest and you see the crest and identify that as a distinct individual but the crests rise and fall and the ocean's there. And um, he, um, he um, used the teaching device that Thich Nhat Hanh uses of a match box and asks, where's the flame? And takes out a match and strikes it and asks, where's the flame? And blows the match out and asks, where's the flame? Um, and you know his assertion is that the flame is always there, just like my dead grandmother is always here. And he said, well, look, you, know, you might say that I'm just imagining it when I say that my dead grandmother is always here. But when I'm talking to you, I don't really know you. I'm imagining you also. So how do we train our minds and direct our imaginations into more of a sense of connection and mutuality rather than separation and competition. And I don't think I'm doing it justice, but there's just rich, rich stuff there that's been deeply grounding uh, and, and moving for me. Um, and and um, uh, the other place I take refuge in this, you know, in, in the sense of, of doom and the, you know, what Doug so eloquently talked about at the beginning is that the wonderful story that shows up in many different cultures of the old farmer and the white horse and his young son. Uh, and I, I, you know, Jerry, you're naughty. I know some of you know the story, the you know, beautiful horse, lovely son, the horse runs away. People in the village say that's terrible. The farmer says, well, we'll see. Son goes off to find the horse, um, comes back, not just with the horse, but with a, a, a mare that the horse has found and mated with in the forest. And people say, see, that's terrific. And the farmer says, we'll see. And the son rides the horse and falls and breaks his leg. And they say, it's terrible. And he said, well, we'll see. And the czar's people come to, to draft the young men of the village, but they don't take his son because his leg is broken. And that's terrific. Well, we'll see. You know, the sense of we don't know what the playing out of what the changes is and that there will be changes upon changes upon changes um, is, a kind of, is a kind of solace for me. It's just kind of, you know, 
reminding myself that I don't know how things are going to play out. And they look very dark now, as imagine they did when, you know, when Germany rolled into France, you know, and when various other catastrophes have happened and the waves rise and fall. So I take some comfort in that. On the action side of things, um, um, <clears throat> I'm I'm in a in, in a flurry of enthusiasm about a new venture. I've I've been, as some of you know, I've spent most of my career advising large corporates on sustainability strategies, and it's a schizophrenic life because I'm in the heart of the beast that is part of the problem, trying to guide it to somewhat better behavior, um, working inside to help them make money, and working outside to criticize the whole structure of things. And it's been a schizophrenic game. Uh, and what I'm doing now is rather than selling advice, uh, I'm building, um, a, I don't know if we're calling it a holding company or a hedge fund or a private equity, equity company or what have you, but to go into the world of small and medium size, small and medium size enterprises who don't have sustainability departments and R&D departments and so forth, but are building the, you know, the picks and shovels of the next economy. Uh, and um, buy a bunch of small to mid-sized companies, bring to them all the riches that our networks have, uh, most obviously um, um, around climate and circularity and purpose and transparency and engagement and entrepreneurship and workplace democracy and exit, not by IPO or by selling to a big hedge fund, but by selling to a worker owned company. So we wind up with ecologically grounded in place uh, worker owned companies. Um, um, with the background question of what might it be, what might it be like, Pete, I don't read Chinese, sorry. Uh, what might it be like to do business and do everything else as though we belonged to the living world? Not being nicer to nature, not taking better care of nature, but actually belonging to the living world as creatures with all the other creatures in that. So that's kind of the background mood and the actual strategy is to do this private equity for good and use the tools of finance uh, and apply them for a purpose, which is, uh, you know, companies that are sustainable and democratic and owned by their employees and rooted in their communities. So that's what I'm up to. Uh, we've just started circulating the story to friendly investors in the last couple of days. So the response uh, so far is, is really interested and positive and reinforcing. Um, um, I'm uh, about to pay a retainer to a law firm to help structure the thing. Um, 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 Kevin, I don't know if you're still on the call. Kevin has been a tremendous asset and resource in connecting me into networks of people around the country doing related things. There's, there is a flurry of activity and worker ownership conversions happening in the United States today. Um, there's a phenomenon, phenomenon called the silver tsunami, uh, which is, um, you know, you know, depending on who you talk to, 150 to 180,000 business owners who, you know, look kind of like, look more like me and Doug. Um, than like Mark and Wendy, you know, people who are aging out, uh, who have founded companies, um, who may not have a family to take over their business, may not have a place to sell their business, uh, are concerned about legacy. And so there's a lot of activity looking at how, to, how do you create a, a, a transition from a one, one person owned company to a worker owned company at this point of change where the company could just die uh, but could be something vital. Uh, none of that effort that we're aware of has brought in the climate and sustainability dimension. So we're trying to marry those, sustainability, silver tsunami, and democratic ownership together. Um, so my request to you all is, uh, you know, first of all, as always, any good thinking and good ideas. And second, how to apply the various OGME stuff in support of that venture. Um, because um, um, both at the level of the enterprise themselves, but also the networks between them and the networks of networks in the world, um, there's a lot of juice here. Um, we are going to, um, we're going to open source the model of what we do. This is not trying to be the, you know, the one hedge fund that rules them all, but something that we'll do probably in place, probably in California, but then build a playbook that we can say to anybody, take this and run with it and improve it and go from there. So I would welcome any, um, any um, ad advice and support about how to do that better, smarter, faster, 
uh, uh, more interactively. Um, so that's what I got. Thanks, Gil. Dr. McLean, may have some advice. Yeah. Um, so would a tapestry for people who have projects and people who have funding be of value? Mm -hmm. Okay. Of course. Yeah, right. And, and yeah. so do you see it needing, see, I feel like if a tapestry is not as useful, if mm -hmm. the connection and the matchmaking should really actually and appropriately go through a one person or a group of people. But if there is, um, if there's an advantage to having people find each other yeah. outside of a call or outside of a meeting or outside of a summit, right, or something like that, then I think the tapestry can be enormously, enormously uh, helpful. Um, yeah. and, and I just yeah. one ca caveat too, is that we tend to think about things as transactions, right? That's the way we're trained, right? And so I have a need, you have an offer, let's match these yep. up. And yep. I am interested in that. I'm more interested in the connection, which you yep. were also referring to, right? And the relationship building that can come from it. Yeah. So let me let me turn my yes into a yes, into a yes. And for the, for the um, turnaround fund that we're building, probably not so much because that's, you know, that's direct interactions between specific companies. Uh, and small groups of people and some level of, 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 of um, confidentiality that needs to, needs to be in place as those things develop until they become public. For the larger network of all the folks in the country working on worker ownership transitions and community-based economics, the kind of things that Kevin has been talking about. Kevin, I'm putting words in your mouth here if you're still there. I think for that kind of network, it could be invaluable both for people to get a sense of momentum and like, oh my God, this is really happening at a much bigger scale than I realized. And also the level of, well, look at what we can learn from each other. Here's what they learned in Baltimore. And here's what didn't work in Denver. And here's how I can apply that in St. Louis, invaluable. And that's a, um, that's a great example of the power of decentralization, decentralized mechanisms within a shared norm. Yeah, love it. Yeah, and, and in, in conjunction with um, the tapestry, it's our conversations um, in small groups and, and particularly with Vincent have gone into, okay, so what about a, a way within Trove for a community to share resources inside a mini Trove, right? So that they can share success stories, share, um, share what's not working well, what is working well, Here's how it's working for me, and then you know you go back to the tapestry to basically create a new, you know, to figure out who who needs to be in those conversations or who yep. needs to be in those troves. Um, yep. So it sounds like, from your perspective and what you just what you just replied with, is it both? It's the combination yep. of both that would actually be yep. even more powerful. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, the um... yeah, if I may add. How, um, let, me, let me just let me just say one thing okay, to okay. Wendy first. As I think about um, you know going into a you know sixty person manufacturing company in Fresno and trying to do what we do, um, they're going to need a very a much more accessible UX than any of the stuff that we're playing with. So I don't say that it's a criticism because we're developmental here, uh, but you know the stuff that we're doing has a pretty high bar of geekiness compared to what you know like a late operator has to. It has to. And so we've been, you know, one of the things I'm going to need is something that is like, you know, dead, simple, fun, easy, that gets at what you and everybody else is talking about. Yeah. And, and of course, that's one of the hurdles, right? And that was one of the hurdles I was trying to overcome when I kind of backed into the tapestry project as a starting point, right? Mm -hmm. So because um, what I'm envisioning is much more complex <laughs> in the end. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. needs an, a UX that I'm being told is really not quite ready yet. So I'm, I'm hoping that the tapestry can be something of a, of a in-between because we need it sooner. Yep. Uh, Klaus, yeah, I would, I would argue that uh, I mean, the European Union and, and uh, CREU, Presencing Institute, everybody pretty much landed on blockchain technology to facilitate mm -hmm. that process, mm -hmm. you know, because it, it, a, a blockchain-based token, for example, forces you into... Uh, a, a very disciplined process of assigning value, right? So, so for example, uh, if you shift uh, a farmer into a, into a model that uh, repairs his soil, but also uh, uh, impacts water, impacts bio, uh, 
uh, biodiversity and things like this. How do you assign value to these to these multiple factors, which then should come together into mm -hmm. a value token that is yeah. that is based on a statistical model, which says if you do all these things in five years from now, here you will have achieved regenerative organic certification. Yeah. Yeah. Then once you have that token, yeah. now you can go to town. I mean, now you can go all over the place selling this thing, you know. And so, so I I, I think that just using blockchain technology yeah. automatically creates the discipline that needs to be brought to the table to uh, uh, to to create the valuations and the yeah. metrics we need. Yeah. Klaus, thank you. Um, you know, we we have we have an intuition that blockchain and DAOs will be important in this story at some point. We don't know what that looks like. And then my request to you is, could you send me the the one clearest and most useful piece of writing that you know of that could tell me about DAO and tokens, DAOs and tokens? I started a conversation in GRC. Um, Okay. Uh, because I think we need to put our heads together. This is really uh, complex, right? And they are. Uh, I, I think we need to have a conversation that focuses on just that. Yeah, I need. I need. A, I need a one-on-one cheat sheet before I even have the conversation. So if anybody knows of one, shoot it my way. Jerry, why does why does hedge fund give you the shivers? Uh, is, sorry, what is, private, what is, private, what is, private equity funds, hedge funds, most of the ones that I know. What, what do those mean? Have, what does the word mean to you? Hedge they fund? mean they mean value suck from humanity. Mm -hmm. Right. To me, both of those make yep. me like, holy shit, you really want to start one of those? Now, nope. if you created a new category and renamed it, I'd be interested. Or if you harness the, like your question right now about how do we harness these new mechanisms is super interesting. But, yep. but if, if you go start a private equity fund, you're like, ah, good luck to you, Gil. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, one of the slides says private equity for good. And the, and the, and the, and the provocation is, can we take the tools that those folks have used to buy companies and strip assets and fire employees and move to Mexico and leave a smoking carcass on the landscape. Bingo. And we use those tools instead in a situation of, of distressed companies with founders leaving that will die and use those tools to lift value and create enough value to Damn. reward us and our investors and the outgoing founder and the new owners who are the workers. Because if we leave them with something saddled with debt like an LBO, that's bullshit. They've got to be positioned to be prosperous in whatever terms that means to them. So, so I think we have to use those words and, and, you know, and, and, and jujitsu them in some kind of way. Um, I'm very much open to other terms. Um, but, so, but we're going to create an institution that will buy, that will take investment and buy companies and sell companies. So what do we call that? Right, exactly. And, and so uh, two thoughts to, that I wanted to yeah. add, and then I wanted to go back to our queue so we get through yeah. as many people as we can. Um, two things I wanted to add. One, uh, I just got reconnected a bit to Jim Fallows, and Jim and Deb flew their, their private plane across country recently, visited a bunch of small towns, wrote a book about that called Our Towns. Uh, did a PBS special on that called Our Towns and have created the Our Towns Foundation. And they're really, really interested in connecting small towns with what might actually help pull them out of their situations and improve cool. their situations. Cool. So I think, I think that uh, there's, a, there's a really interesting marriage of sorts or dating system of sorts between the tapestry that Wendy's painting, uh, the things you'd like to fund, Gil, and cool. kind of the, the, the opportunities that that uh, Jim and Deb are trying to point to and the, the, the community and trust that they're building in these different places. Because part of what they're skilled at is showing up somewhere in a tiny airport in the middle of the country, finding their way into interesting people and conversations and saying, hey, you know, how does this work? And I, I think that, that a hugely important thing in the next couple electoral cycles is humans showing up across the country, across the middle of the country to help in, in, a, in an actually sincere way, not saying, hey, here's the solution, just do this, but rather saying, here's what we know, here's stories we've heard, here's resources we, that, that we know how to get to, how do we help you figure out your way? So something like that. And then, and then you're in the middle of a huge set of questions that I, I talk about them as what are the next two stacks? And I'm borrowing here the LAMP stack or other software stacks, but I'm saying we have a civilization social stack and we have an organizational business stack. 
and they're screwed up. They're both of them screwed up right now. The, the, the civilizational one is turning into illiberal democracy or state in control. And the social stack and the, and the business stack is like, hey, we've just figured out that capitalism is eating the world and we're trying to replace those narratives. So hopefully you and we and everyone will find our way into what probably won't be two stacks. I have a funny feeling that nation states and those boundaries are getting softer and we're, we're entering some place where maybe there's one stack, I don't know, but a hundred years from now, they're gonna tell the stories about how in these years right now, somebody figured something out. And uh, that became the, the set of, uh, and, and either we spiraled wildly out of control and destroyed ourselves, uh, but for a while there, we made a lot of profit like that cartoon in the cave. Um, or we will actually be uh, in, uh, on some new stacks, if you will. And, and I, I, I'm borrowing software stacks on purpose, solution stacks on purpose, uh, because so much of this is going to be instantiated as code. And the relationships that we layer on top of the code are more important than the code, but the code is going to be the carrier, the vehicle, the, the transport, the, the platform, the scaffolding for all of this. Um, and we have just a little bit of time because we're, we're creeping up on, on the end of our, our time here, but I had in the queue, uh, Stuart, Grace, Mark, Scott, me. So Stuart, why don't you go ahead and uh, let's see where we go. Great, so um, my mind is kind of exploding in a lot of different ways. And, and what I'm trying to do is, 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 is collate some, some thoughts. Um, Jerry, you just you just mentioned relationships on top of the stack of software, and that's where I think the key is. And earlier, you actually mentioned um, what's eaten our minds, because th that's the key. Um, both Gil and Klaus, you're doing great things, but you're still framing it all in kind of a capitalist um, thinking process of profit and loss. Um, and I think that that's, that's where the mindsets that we all have um, just need to change in some way. Um, and I'm not denigrating any of your efforts in any way, shape, or form. As a matter of fact, Gil, I want to connect you to my son-in-law, who's been a McKinsey consultant in private equity for the past 15 years and just in the process of leaving because he's created some new kind of instrument. But I think he, you could learn a, a lot about the field just by talking to him. Um, um, the Buddhist references um, today, uh, a absolutely um, wonderful because everything gets created in, in our own minds. Um, and that's what we need to uh, 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 focus on. Um, I'll come back to it in a second, but I heard Fernando Flores use the term radical discontinuity about 30 years ago. And I think that's what Jerry's kind of pointing to here. Uh, my check-in today, I wanted to just read a poem, um, and it's one of my, it's one of my poems, um, and I had a choice. The actual poem for the 3rd of February is, is called um, Failure, um, but I don't want to read that. It's about resilience. Uh, tomorrow's poem is called uh, Creating, and, and this is what everyone here is actually doing. It's, it's, it's really inspirational to hear everybody um, thinking. Now, just something about these poems um, very, very quickly. Um, when when it, they first started to emerge out of me, which was a surprise, um, I talked to some people about it and people, I was told that before there was the written word, um, wisdom was passed on through iambic pentameter, through the, through the, through the spoken word. Um, and, and so, um, I'll offer this poem to everyone today. Um, and some reflective questions. Where does your creativity come from? And what's its impact? What are the benefits of innovation and creativity? Ah, one other thought um, that, that really applies to everyone here. No seed ever sees the flower. And everybody here is an extraordinary seed. Um, so creating. Sourced by a drive to create, make a new, no template. Traveling places never been, enduring loneliness within. Footsteps of advancing age, harness existential rage. Give to those at your side 
through bumps and backslide. Longing, driving, pushing on, directions you've never gone. Victory, an impossible dream, embrace process and a scheme. Know in your hidden recess, exploring new is happiness. Context learning facing east, each day, delicious feast. Creating growing is the thrust, arise from inside if you trust. Follow voices deep inside, innovation, how we thrive. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you very much. That's awesome. Um, Thank you. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a lovely place um, maybe to end the call. I have to, I have to boogie because I have to join a different call. Unfortunately, I'm happy to pass the con to someone if we would like to keep the call going. And the people left who haven't had a chance to check in are Grace, Mark, and Scott, with my apologies. Um, should I pass the con or should we wrap the call? I'm ready to wrap. I'm here to wrap. Okay, who wants to who wants to take us out in wrap? Maybe not. Okay, I guess I guess none of us. <laughs> which speaks to our lack of diversity, actually. Um, so, I thank you all. This has been a phenomenal conversation. And uh, Stuart, if you will, uh, if you have a link to the poem and can share that, that'd be fabulous. Yeah, I'll put it. I'll put it in the uh, in the yeah in the Mattermost or the OGM list. Either one would be great, and we'll we'll curate it. What I would always love would be like a breakdown of the amount of time that people speak in these calls, because some people speak a hell of a lot longer than others. And um, that kind of mm, situation um, is interesting. Is it? And, and what is that? And I'm not sure. Is it power? Is it? Um, is it what? That's it. Thanks. Bye. So, so Mark, um, that's a really good point. And as facilitator, host, holder of the space, what I some a tool I sometimes use, but haven't used that often here, is hey, everybody who's spoken a lot, step back. Everybody who hasn't had a chance, you know, to, to grab the mic, come in. In this format, I'm doing the check-in where I try to make it around the room, but but I'm also very intentionally scratching on interesting things. It's sort of the the the, the dip the ladle into the into the stream of what everybody's doing, and then stir the pot. And so I stirred the pot a lot today on things that brought a bunch of us in intensely. And that turns into an imbalance in the use of airtime, which I'm trying to pay attention to and is irritating if you didn't get to check in. And I apologize for that. But it's an important issue that I'm trying to balance. But I appreciate your bringing it up. And I'm sorry for frustration it causes. Oh, it, it's, it's not so much frustration as fascination. I'm fascinated by this phenomenon myself, trying to balance it, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah. Uh, one, uh, my only comment for today, I think, and in response to Mark, I think is, I've noticed that the check-ins, I'm longing for the check-ins. And what I'm hearing are responses. Mm. And I'm not hearing any no. check-ins. Mm. Now, our last speaker, Stuart, he had a check-in. This is something that I did outside of this group. I'm bringing it to you. And what I'm hearing is a lot of, I don't know, I'm here to respond to what everyone else is saying as opposed to I'm bringing you something that I did outside of here. We can also um, pick up some clues from Quaker meeting uh, where there are messages in Quaker meeting that come out of silence and you are not supposed to respond to other messages. And that's, that's a, a very particular form of group format. That's a very process. interesting format and one that um, encourages listening without contributing. Right. Um, it's very fascinating, I'll say. It's mystical. It's lovely. I've had a, a bunch of really cool experiences in Quaker meeting. In what way is listening not contributing? It's listening without... Um, responding to what you, I, I agree with you completely, Grace. Listening is contributing. Um, and were I to listen without contributing, I would not contribute my talking right now. Bye. <laughs> um, but thank you for that. And with that, we will wrap today's call. Uh, thank you all for being here. Lots.